April 30th, 2016 marked the day that I, along with the rest of Phenomena Group, began my microcampus journey in Shijou to learn about myself as well as a topic of high interest. For me, that topic was wall propaganda. In just the first few days, I saw hundreds of propagandists scattered throughout a timeline of the entire past century, and I didn't know what to focus on. But soon I noticed that older messages from early New China held meanings that were historical, powerful, and priceless. Meanings I would not be able to find anywhere else. And I would often watch as those messages were destroyed, torn down, and reconstruction. It led me to decide that I would focus on preserving those meanings within older propagandas. My focus would be narrowed down even more. As I conversed with Mr. Zhao, Ms. Dong, and some other locals, I realized that they all shared similar facts and thoughts about the events that propagandas were based upon. If I continued asking for such facts, I would end up with a textbook article. So I decided I didn't want to just interpret the surface meanings of the messages. Instead, I wanted to go deeper into what was beyond the messages. I would do so by zooming in on the differences between people's stories. I came up with this thesis. In order to comprehend the history of early New China, one must understand three different perspectives during the land reforms, the Great Leap Forward, and the Cultural Revolution. First up is land reforms. 地主分散有罪,农民之治的光荣 is a surviving message from the land reforms, or 土地改革. It translates to landlords' actions are sinful. Farmers are supposed to own their land. This shows how the government of that time had a general hatred for landlords who kept land to themselves, and how they believed peasants should take equal shares of land. It was a great example of lower members of society rising to replace higher members of society. Mr. Zhao and Ms. Jiang told me that Xizhou locals were all either farmers or merchants. Even then, I was surprised that most locals agreed with this message. But after hearing Ms. Yang Xian, Mr. Zhao, and Mr. Yang's horrible experiences with landlords, I came to understand their side of the situation. They recalled landlords had taken them as slaves since they were as young as me. All peasants were often whipped, tortured, starved, screamed at, and even killed for the slightest mistakes. They cowered in constant fear and anxiety. But once the land reforms came around, they were issued equal shares of land, food, and shelter. From their point of view, everything finally evened out, and landlords now had to work for themselves. On the other side, landlords' families look back on the event with frustration and contempt. It almost seems like a given fact. Of course they would be upset about their sudden demotion. However, there's actually much more to it. Miss Zhang's grandfather was a kind landlord and risked his life multiple times, fighting in wars for China's people, thus protecting the peasants working under him. But just because he took more than one wife, he was murdered with seven shots in the head. His family was left uncared for. Mr. Yang also saddened over a lost friend who had committed no crime, but was similarly killed, simply for being a landlord. Ms. Zhang said these shootings were the government's way of creating unreasonable opposition among peasants and a united hatred for landlords. The next big event is the Great Leap Forward. When I first distinguished the harvest lady on an alleyway, I almost envied her for the bountiful of crops and goods in her hands. It shocked me to the core when Mr. T said she was created during the Great Leap Forward. That was an event Chairman Mao had launched, hoping to exponentially increase China's agricultural production rate. Instead, this created a great famine, causing over 40 million deaths. But the existence of that propaganda got me thinking. Was this another event with more than one perspective? And indeed, it was. One perspective was that the Great Leap Forward was an overall disaster. Mr. Gao called it a mad race for crops, and recalled how nobody would get a moment of rest. If you traveled back in time, he joked, you'd be captured and dragged into the fields for work. Mr. Li Yang is another man who worked both in the bank and in the grains department during the time. He mentioned how the economy just kept plunging downwards. And both Mrs. Zhang and Mr. Li Yang complained about food distribution. Even though work points had faded from the system, farmers were still given food according to their work, and they never considered how many mouths each worker had to feed or if they fell sick. To them, it was a disaster. The other perspective was that it was a worthy cause. Mr. Yin was one of the locals who worked for the army, which was highly prioritized. 
They were always well-fed despite the rest of the population starving to death. But he found this quite fair because the Chinese really depended on the military during that time. Mr. Zhang, who had been a starved farmer, surprisingly shared the same information and opinions with Mr. Yin. He was constantly hungry, but still believed that crops were being sent for good reason. He explained that the food was being sent to Vietnam and North Korea, both struggling to hold off American troops. If the supplies hadn't been provided for them, America would have won and moved on to invade China next. Locals with this perspective said, Food distribution had been as fair as possible, even if it wasn't perfectly equal. The last event is the Cultural Revolution. Zhong Sheng Bu Wang Mao Zhu Xi translates to Do Not Ever Forget Chairman Mao. It shows the intense love for Mao that was expected from every single Chinese resident during the Cultural Revolution, which was a time of immense change and reforms. Mao had finally launched it with the purpose of permanently striking down all educated or wealthy citizens, and promoting farmers and poor citizens. There were often denunciation meetings where once respected citizens were severely tortured by those who were from lower classes. From this time period, there were both beneficiaries and victims. Beneficiaries from the Cultural Revolution were mostly low-class, uneducated citizens. Miss Dong was my first local contact, my first jump out of my comfort zone to confront a stranger and dive into sensitive conversation. She said the Cultural Revolution brought her and the other farmers out of poverty. It wasn't surprising that Mr. Zhao, Ms. Yang Xian, and Mr. Duan, who came from farming families, all shared similar thoughts. Their salaries, food, opportunities, and treatment among society all rocketed because of the Cultural Revolution. When I interviewed former soldier Mr. Duan, he related how the farmers were all with Mao, feeling strongly for the propagandists that all promoted Mao and the Communist Party. They pretty much worshipped Mao's ideals and causes for the Cultural Revolution, disregarding the chaos and missed it all. Mr. Zhao summed it all up with, what Mao did was amazing. It was worth the small mistakes along the way. I talked to many victims as well. Linden Center staff Matt was a grandson of a teacher. I always knew of the high degree of violence from the Cultural Revolution, but it still sent shivers down my spine when Matt told me of his grandpa suffering from thick needles pushed into his knees, bloody beatings, and imprisonment in dungeons full of water. Many forms of art and culture were destroyed, too. I would see defaced, blank panels all around town. When I observed them at the cheese factory, Miss Zhang informed me that it was Red Guards, young students that fought for Mao, who raided homes and destroyed intricate artworks, valuable antiques, and anything related to wealth or education. This was something I had also read of, but seeing it all right there before me really brought the realism slamming down. I felt a deep loss for the wonderful things that no longer existed. But it didn't stop there. Education for an entire generation just disappeared. It made me especially sad hearing Miss Dong, Miss Jang, and Miss Lee admit that they couldn't even read and write. Mr. Yang and Mr. Wong were both top students with dream jobs but the re-education impact hit just when they were preparing for their college admission tests. I realized that so many people could no longer fulfill their dreams. The stories and thoughts I've shared are all truthful, honest narrations of locals in Shizhou. I realized that the constant existence of differing perspectives in those stories occur in our daily life as well. My experiences with locals here have taught me that events in life always have more than one standing point. And from now on, I will always remember to step into the other side's shoes while judging situations. I hope that after watching this, you will have gained the same valuable takeaways that I have. Thank you to Mr. T and Ms. Mai for your patience and steady support and for managing this process. Thank you to the locals of Shizhou for welcoming us into the village and for sharing your stories with us. Thank you to Phenomena for spending these incredible four weeks with me. You have helped lift my spirits during difficult, challenging times and become my second family. I will definitely miss being with you guys.